Shalom. Shalom. Any guesses as to what that actually means? Most people, when asked this question, jump straight to a definition, trying to explain a deeper meaning. Peace, shalom, they say, is a state we all want to attain for ourselves and for the people that we love. Peace for some might come from within, from simple things that affect our spirit, our soul. And for others, it's deeper and broader, the presence of good health, serenity, happiness, harmony, and safety. The point I want to make is that we all want to have peace. And when we have it, we want to hold it, preserve it, maintain it, and cherish it. And once we have it, we want others to have it too. We want to share peace, we want to spread peace, we wish it for other people. So today I'm going to talk about peace in three ways. Firstly, as a tangible thing, an all-encompassing thing to have and to seek. And second, once peace is found, how do we go about holding onto it? How do we maintain it as a state of mind? as a way of preserving, a way of living closely with God. And then finally, how do we share peace? How do we give peace and wish peace for others? Saying shalom in many cultures is a greeting, a way to acknowledge another. It's the same as how we greet people in English when we say hello and goodbye. It was actually Thomas Edison, the so-called inventor of the light bulb, who put hello into common usage. He urged people to use his telephone and say hello when answering. But the word goodbye is a mashup of four words that at one point were commonly said. Those four words were God be with you, pronounced go be with you, which eventually became goodbye. But like peace and shalom, it was said as a blessing, giving your goodwill to the person who was leaving your presence. May God be with you, keeping you safe, keeping you in his will, keeping you on the receiving end of life's blessings. And so in the Middle East today, when you greet someone or you say goodbye and you say shalom, you are literally saying, may you be full of well-being or may health and prosperity be upon you. And it's truly a lovely thing to say. So when I'm asked what does the word shalom mean, it's all about peace. It's all about a deep, rich, life-impacting peace. It's not just the absence of war or misery or anxiety or suffering. It's the presence of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of peace. And like I said, we all want it. Because although it can be described as the absence of war, the majority of the time it's used to point to an inner completeness, a wholeness, and it's referred to so many, many times in Scripture. In John 14, Pam read for us, Jesus said, The advocate of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Greek word here actually is not shalom, but a close relative, it's irene. You may have heard the English word irene, which actually means aiming at peace. And for sure, You've heard the name Irene, which means peace. When Jesus refers to leaving his peace with his disciples, he uses the Greek word for Irene. And here it means security, safety, prosperity, felicity, intense happiness, because peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. Quite awe-inspiring what he said there, what he meant there. And he said, I don't give my peace in the way that the world gives peace, which makes us question, well, what does peace look like in the world? In the world, there are multiple forces influencing any sense of peace that there might be. And sadly, there really is no stability in the peace 
that the world offers, the war in Ukraine, the war in Gaza, to name just two. There's no peace on this planet, and any peace the world has, it's fickle and it's short-lived. So the peace that we see in the world is not actually the peace that we want to have. That is, in fact, the nature of anything and everything that the world offers. It's not stable, it's fleeting, it's ultimately unsatisfying, and very often, just not what it appears to be. But the peace that Jesus gives us, which again is an aspect of his character, his very own self, is a shalom, or a sense of the ironic that burrows deep down into our lives. And it's the peace that comes through the most stable and trustworthy of relationships, yours and my relationship with God. When Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, he's really talking about something very profound. He's speaking of the salvation that his death and resurrection will achieve for his disciples, total well-being and inner rest of spirit in fellowship with God. So, once we have this peace, how do we hold on to it? Like every aspect of our character and every fruit of the Spirit, it gets tested by real life. And what's going on inside us most often gets tested with things going on outside of us. Our character often is tested by external factors. It's like when you're carrying a drink and someone bumps into you and if your glasses or mug is full, then it spills over. Depending on how full the glass is, depends on how much spills out, but what spills out of us when people bump up against us? Is it a mouth full of expletives and angry cries, or is it gracious and kind and understanding? In real life, this can be measured in a number of ways. It could be how short a fuse you have. Do you get angry easily? Do you have that kind of confrontational personality that demands explanations and has high expectations of other people's behaviour? Or has the peace of God truly found a home deep inside us so that it takes a great deal of external aggravation to get our goat or to disturb us? Whatever the challenge to our peace, when our lifestyle is one of living close to Jesus, spending lots of time in his word, in communion with God and prayer, whatever the challenge to our peace, we hold on to it. Many would say that the Isle of Wight is constantly troubled by poor transport on and off the island. But in reality, I found that that depends on when you want to travel across the mainland or whether you want to go at all. The more that you have reason to leave the Isle of Wight by ferry or red jet or fast cat or hover, the more your awareness of the transport inadequacies, the more you're aware that the whole system is notoriously unreliable and seemingly terribly mismanaged. But having lived here for 18 years, I've come to realise that travel on and off the island tests us, and will continue to do so forever, unless we controversially build the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but other things and other people test us too. Virtually all of life tests us, and the tests test our character, how we respond when things go wrong. So you could say that the fruit of the Spirit is constantly growing in us and constantly being challenged. And normally, it's really, really hard for us to see ourselves for who we really are. And that's one really good reason that we need close, honest, and kind people, trustworthy people in our lives, who help us to see our own growth and be part of that growth. So holding on to peace is as much about growing with that peace as it is about staying the same. There are many references of how to live in peace in the Bible. In Romans chapter 14, we learn that the kingdom of God is a place of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he says it's got nothing to do with external things, but rather with the heart, 
the condition of your heart. The place where God reigns is on the inside through faith in Jesus. And as things like righteousness, peace and joy grow in us, we then reflect more and more the values of the kingdom and the nature of the king. <coughs> At my recent Curiously training a couple of weeks ago, we were discussing holiness, and we determined after much discussion that God is, of course, the Holy One, but that actually each of us is in turn holy too. As since we've given our hearts to Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides in our hearts. That means we hold a holy space, which is the kingdom of God. So there is space reserved for that peace and that joy. There is this personal benefit that we experience in knowing Jesus. For me, it was one of the most overwhelming aspects of becoming a disciple of Jesus, that of having peace. Before I knew Jesus in the way I do now, I lived pretty much in perpetual anxiety, always from you always feeling like I was on the back foot, <coughs> worrying about things that might not happen, trying to cross the bridge before I got there, feeling inadequate, feeling like an imposter, feeling insecure. And I was really weak and really negative and quite flaky, if I'm honest, wanting someone else to solve my problems for me, not wanting to take responsibility for my <coughs> decisions. But as millions of people can testify as well, coming to know Jesus brought me into an experience of peace that I had no idea existed. I thought life was all about worrying, fear, and anxiety. And I know that that might sound weird to you, those of you that know me well, because that's the opposite of the way I am now. The peace of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, in a human life brings us to a place of calm. And as we learn to trust more and more, as we experience God's faithfulness over and over again, we become people of peace. And it's as people of peace that we know and we live in relationship with the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. As people of peace, we can just by living as faithfully as we are trying to live, show other people how to have peace. And that leads me to think about how we give peace. How do we share it? Well, peace can be understood as the fruit or the outcome of reconciliation. If you have trusted in Jesus alone as the one who died for your sins, and you have received him as your Lord and Saviour, you have peace because you have been reconciled to God. That would be quite enough to spend a whole lifetime wrapping your head around. But there's more. Amazingly, there's more. We learn in 2 Corinthians that peace is a gift from God given to us through Christ. And when he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation, we became reconcilers. We received the gift of salvation, of life that comes from the hand of God. And we live that gift. We live Jesus, and we give Jesus to others in our actions, in our words, in our prayers. This is huge. It goes far beyond having personal peace. That grace that we have experienced from God is intended by God for us to pass on to others. So we ourselves, we become how God brings others into his peace through knowing Jesus. That's all we have to do. We have been made conduits, channels, to share God's peace. What an amazing privilege. You and I have been chosen by God to lead people to peace through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Every gift, every blessing that God gives you and gives me has two outcomes. He gives to you and me to bless you and me. And then he gives it to you and me to pass our lives on to others. And this is true for kindness and patience, and it's also true for his love. When he was on earth, he went through some of the worst things a person could ever go through, a 
and he didn't lose his peace. So we, what do we do? We open our lives to Jesus. We talk about what he has done for us in our lives. We testify. We share just a bit of our life story. And in sharing how we have accepted God's peace, we then give others a chance to experience it too. Sometimes, when you don't have peace, there's a lot of reasons for that. It could be that you haven't forgiven yourself for something that you have done or said. But Jesus offers forgiveness completely for everything that you've ever done. And he can't do that because he doesn't know. He does that because he totally gets what it is to live this life, a hard, hard life, because he did it himself when he was on this planet. And he can do this, he can forgive you because he's actually God in the flesh, offering to forgive you, offering to hold you, offering his love and his deep, abiding peace. He gives us his grace, his unmerited favour, unearned, undeserved, and he gives us his peace. God made peace. God's peace is a person. God's peace is his own son, Jesus Christ. And he wants us to place love above all things and let the peace of God rule in our hearts and for us to be thankful. When we give what we have received with the love of Christ abiding in us, the peace of God can and will and does rule our hearts. And we find peace and we hold on to peace and we're able to live at peace with all the people around us. We can't live in peace on our own or in isolation from God or other people. When we gain it and we have it, we, all of us, become peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And we make peace because God has made peace inside us. We love one another as Christ has loved us. We give peace because we have his peace. And as Jesus promised in our reading this morning, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Through his Holy Spirit, we have his peace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, just as Paul concluded in his letter to the church in Corinth, Help us become complete. Help us to be of good comfort. Help us to be of one mind. A people of peace. To live in peace. And help us to remember each and every day that we have you, the God of love and peace with us. In all that we have, in all that we hold, in all that we do. Please help us to share that peace with each and every person we meet. Amen. Amen.